please give a big round of applause for Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney and candidate for president of the Green Party. In order to survive an organism, a species, a specific community, humankind must understand its environment and adapt so that it can withstand potentially hostile environmental changes. Because Africa is so rich in resources upon which civilization as we know it has grown to depend, because Africans were so resilient in what might have been harsh environments for others, because black people could be used to satisfy the needs and wants of others, our very survival has had to overcome external and internal threats to our very existence. Our survival as a distinct group, worthy of self-determination, and not just as the source of other people's gratification, depends on our ability to understand our environment, test it for its hostility, fashion strategies to survive in the face of such hostility, and when that environment changes, adapt our strategy to the new circumstances. And so, it is to the political environment of African Americans that I must now turn. Those of you accustomed to hearing my messages know that I will recite the statistics that inform us of the state of black America. You know that I will remind us all of the dire conditions facing our country as well as our community. I read the Hull House Loyola University report entitled Minding the Gap, which stated that there were to be, that were there to be no changes whatsoever in policy, that it would take black Chicagoans 200 years to catch up to the quality of life enjoyed by those who are white and live in Chicago. Referencing the report, the Chicago Sun-Times wrote, page by page, paragraph by paragraph, and line by line, the report describes two completely different cities, documenting disparities in income, education, housing, transportation, health care, and safety. The report itself points out whites are 125% more likely to use marijuana than blacks, 181% more likely to use cocaine, 431% more likely to use inhalants, 516% more likely to use LSD. And yet blacks account for 79% of all drug arrests. Even in reading about Chicago politics, it became perfectly clear that before there was a Colonel Karpinski and Abu Ghraib, there was a Burge and a Daly responsible for the Chicago Police Department's Area 2. And finally, in its 2005 report, among other things, United for a Fair Economy, told us that it would take 1,664 years to close the home ownership gap and that on some indices, the racial disparities are worse now than at the time of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In their 2006 report, United for a Fair Economy told us that blacks and Latinos lost ground. And in order to close the racial wealth divide in our country, it would take the equivalent of a GI Bill for everyone. That would include comprehensive federal investment in low-income families and communities with an emphasis on people of color. They recommended, I believe, what very few in this room would disagree with, progressive taxes on wealthy individuals and profitable corporations to fund a real ownership society not the phony proposals being put forward by the Bush administration. And unfortunately, in their 2007 State of the Dream report, United for a Fair Economy wrote that people of color support Democrats in the voting booth, 
but are still waiting for policies and programs that close the economic gap between them and whites. They wrote that African Americans should expect more from Democrats than what was received from the congressional Democratic majorities first 100 hours. They wrote that people of color vote blue, but stay in the red. So where's the outrage? And where's the agenda for change? According to the statistics, staying in the red means that our college graduates will continue to earn on the average half as much as the overall population of college graduates over their lifetimes. Staying in the red means continued astronomical incarceration rates for our children and their continued criminalization even in schools where administrative remedies exist, like in the Gina 6 and the Palmdale 4 cases. Staying in the red means that more and more of our families will de be displaced in what some have called Hurricane America, wherein gentrification is displacing millions of families of color, not nearly as violently, but the result is practically the same as has happened with Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Staying in the red means that merely increasing the minimum wage is insufficient because even if the minimum wage were to be increased every year at 70 cents per year, a minimum wage worker supporting a family of three still would not rise above the poverty level until 2013. Without specific funds for affirmative action programs that close the gaps in health, education, employment, incarceration, and other indices on which our country fails to perform, staying in the red means continuing to put up with the same inequalities that in some cases are worsening and hoping somehow to escape the consequences of the numbers. If we continue to do what we've always done, we'll continue to get what we've always been given. And that means staying in the red. <laughs> Clearly, if black people fail to demand a discussion, an agenda, solid policy proposals that redress these circumstances, in my opinion, the black body politic could go the way of the polar bear. I refuse to stand idly by and see my community or any community in this country stay in the red. I refuse to see those statistics go one more day without being addressed. Finally, and this is a big one, electioneering this season will be a billion dollar business. How much of that money is going to minority printers, minority banks, minority pollsters, minority media and political consultants, minority newspapers, radio and internet outlets? Malcolm X said, the black vote can determine who goes to the White House and who stays in the doghouse. In 2000, an estimated one million black people went to the polls and voted their dreams, their hopes, and their aspirations. And the votes of those one million black people were not even counted. Who fought for them? In 2004, it was the black vote again that was targeted for nullification in an election drive-by shooting. How much more will we take? And yet, we still wait for justice, for peace, and for truth. I shudder to think what our country might become if we fail to turn these numbers around. Join me, dare to be different, dare to demand. Our very survival could very well depend on it. Thank you.